Good morning. Uh, we are headed into chapter 9. Uh, we're going to start looking at a topic, uh, linear momentum. Now, um, linear momentum has kind of the same feel as kinetic energy in certain ways. Um, but let's go ahead and see what uh, this momentum is going to mean for us. So here's a couple of billiard balls. Uh, they're running into each other. And uh, the momentum before is listed as m times v. So if I take the mass of the object and the velocity and I multiply those together, I get the momentum. And uh, it collides into another, um, another object over here. And uh, this object is pushed off in some direction. Uh, this has mass m2 and velocity v2. Uh, this is m1 v1, but that was from before and this is after. What we find out with, with uh, linear momentum is that it's a conserved quantity, kind of like energy was. And we can use this to solve problems. So again, this momentum is going to be conserved. We'll jump through the topics here. And uh, so here is how linear momentum is defined. Linear momentum is defined as the mass times the velocity. Now, notice this is vectorially written. These are vectors. And so there's going to be a momentum in the x direction, a momentum in the y, a momentum in the z, depending on what the components of velocity are. So we can match those up. You know, three components of momentum line right up with the three components of velocity uh, for the object. Now, energy was a scalar, just for comparison. Uh, and we do want to keep making these comparisons between uh, kinetic energy and momentum. Now, uh, momentum also shows up as related to the force. If, if we look at all the forces acting on an object, uh, each one of those forces can be thought of as transferring in momentum. Now, in the energy chapters, we called energy transfer work. Uh, momentum transfer is called impulse. And we'll get to some of that stuff and, and take a look. So anyway, this is our basic definition, and this is how momentum is related to force. And uh, we want to be able to make use of that. So here's an example. Here's a car. What's its momentum? What's its kinetic energy? Uh, the mass of the car, let's say, is 1,000 kilograms. Uh, the velocity of the car, let's say, it's traveling at 30 meters per second. Now, these were the formulas for linear momentum and for kinetic energy. So let's do the momentum calculation. M times V, that's not so hard, uh, gives us 1,000 kilograms times 30 meters per second, leaves us with 30,000 kilograms meters per second. So those are the units we have for momentum. Now, when we were looking at energy, energy had a different set of units to it. Uh, kinetic energy was 1 half mv squared. So putting all those numbers in, uh, I ended up with kilograms, meters squared per second squared. That combination, we said, was called joules. So we could write the J. Uh, we don't have a momentum unit. If any of you guys have recommendations for what we could call this, uh, it would be handy to have a set of units specifically designating momentum, but we just leave it at kilograms, meters per second, or the other possible combination is to write this as newtons times seconds. That also works for either of those uh, momentum units. Um, either of those momentum units will work well. Now, when I calculate the momentum, I'm getting 30,000 units of momentum, uh, 30,000 newton seconds. I kind of like the newton seconds. It's shorter. Um, versus 450,000 joules. Now, so what do I have more of? Do I have more kinetic energy or more momentum? And uh, that's kind of a trick question because they, they can't be compared because they're in different units. And so momentum has different units from kinetic energy. I can't do a comparison of which is more. Um, now, the kinetic energy is a scalar. So surprisingly, kinetic energy is not in any particular direction. It's just an amount of energy that the object has. Whereas if this thing's headed in, say, the x direction, then this is the x momentum. So momentum does depend on directional information. 
Okay, here's kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. I don't know how crucial this is, but we can say that uh, if we add up all of the uh, momentum that is transferred to an object, individual pieces of momentum depend on the force acting over a certain amount of time. Now, this integral of force over time is called impulse. And uh, if we integrate the force over time, if we take the force multiplied by time, it tells us how much momentum we've transferred. Now, with kinetic energy, we had uh, a very similar, very analogous formula. We said that every time we did a little bit of energy transfer or work, that would result in a small increase in kinetic energy. So, the same way that increases in kinetic energy come about as a result of forces integrated over displacements, increases in momentum can be calculated as forces integrated over time. And that's called impulse, this is called work. They're both kind of, I, I don't, I think they're both kind of silly names. Uh, I don't know that we, this is really energy transfer and this is momentum transfer. And then the symbols for work is W, which is easy enough, but the symbol for impulse is J. Uh, anyway, uh, that's a momentum transfer. This is an energy transfer. Um, the, so the, the two quantities are, are, are related. Now, let's think about momentum and energy in terms of, let's say we have a collection of molecules. Maybe they're gas molecules. And I got a collection of all these gas molecules. And um, what's the total? kinetic energy of all my gas molecules. Well, to get the total kinetic energy, we would just start adding up all the individual kinetic energies. Energy is a scalar. I could add all of these kinetic energies together. Now, all the kinetic energies are going to be positive. So the kinetic energies, you know, once I start adding them together, they just, they just get larger and larger. The total momentum of all the uh, molecules is a vector, uh, it, it, it's adding vectors together, and so since we have, you know, for every molecule going in this direction, I have a molecule going exactly in the opposite direction, and the momentum cancels out. So the total kinetic energy for a collection of molecules like this, uh, again, I just sum up all the individual kinetic energies, the total momentum is zero. Momentum will cancel, you know, one particle going in one direction and another particle going in the exact opposite direction, those two momentum effects cancel out. All right, let's look at some examples here. Uh, they're saying, uh, here is this tennis player, and they're going to hit this tennis ball, and uh, a tennis ball leaves the racket maybe about 55 meters per second, or about 120 miles an hour. Uh, if the tennis ball has a mass of let's say 60 grams, and it's in contact with the racket for four milliseconds, four thousandths of a second, estimate the force acting on the ball. Um, how, you know, would this be a large enough force to lift a person, which is kind of an interesting comparison, I guess. Anyway, so let's say that the ball starts at rest, we throw it up, it's just hovering right there, and then it gets swatted with this tennis racket, so the velocity is in this direction then, and the force is going to be in that direction. It's got a certain mass, uh, and here's the mass and here is the velocity uh, once the ball leaves the racket. So there was an acceleration that took place uh, during the time when the racket was ex exerting a force on the tennis ball. So there was an acceleration, F over M, and uh, dV dt then is equal to F divided by m. That says that m dv dt is equal to the force, and uh, that leads us to, when we look at the mass, times dv, m times dv is the same thing as dp. So that's a quick derivation of the formula they had given us, saying that the force um, depends on, the force is equal to the rate at which momentum is transferred into an object. So um, that's kind of the general formula. Um, let's go back and look at this tennis ball from this example. 
uh, the momentum that it, it acquires, that it picks up, is uh, equal to m times v. Uh, multiplying these numbers together, that works out to be 3.30 uh, newton seconds. So that's how many units of momentum the tennis ball has after it's been hit with the tennis racket. Now, the, um, the average force, which is what we're after here, is uh, delta P over delta T. And this is the amount of momentum that was transferred. It was transferred in four milliseconds. So it says, you know, during that four milliseconds, the force averaged to be a value of 825 newtons. So, yeah, that's a large enough force that could lift a person of, you know, 80 kilograms. That would be enough force to lift the person off the ground, but, but only for four milliseconds, right, uh, is the length of time when that force was uh, present. So these formulas, too, are just going back. This is just uh, going back and reviewing how, um, how those earlier formulas were derived. All right, here's another example. Now, um, you know, this one was interesting. A uh, tennis racket comes up, hits the ball, uh, and transfers a bunch of momentum. Um, here's another example. Uh, washing a car. Now, if I've got, you know, the hose out and I'm spraying water on the car, I know from experience that that water is exerting a force. I, I can take a hose with water and spray it at something and push something uh, along the driveway, for example. So there's definitely a force uh, of this fluid, of the water, hitting the car and then kind of dropping down. Now, the water leaves the hose at a rate of 1.5 kilograms per second, and the water's going pretty fast, so uh, they got a good spray nozzle on here. It's coming out, it's, it's hitting the car at 20 meters per second, and then the side of the car stops it. So it doesn't splash back. Uh, the force um, or the momentum of that water is all going to be transferred into the car. Now the car doesn't head down the street because the car is parked with its tires on the surface of the earth and so that's a really big object. Once you go, oh the car is attached to planet earth, we're not going to really feel the movement of that planet when we spray a little water. So let's treat the car as if it just stays fixed at some location. The water is coming in. Now, the water is coming in at a constant rate. So uh, 1.5 kilograms per second, and it's got a speed of 20 meters per second. How much momentum is that? And so the force uh, we could calculate as uh, the difference in, you know, the dp dt, a uh, little bits of momentum per time. Now, the momentum can be written as dm times v. So, the momentum, the rate of momentum reaching the car from the water depends on the rate of mass multiplied by its velocity. So, finally, we can write the force then as dm dt times v. Um, and dm dt was given as 1.5 kilograms per second. So that rate, that mass rate, is a number that we want to be able to plug into the formula. So putting this together, uh, that gives us a force. Didn't I write it down? I mean, the force in this case is 30 newtons. So I got 30 newtons of force here. Now, what about more generally? Uh, well, more generally, what we could do is say that it's dm dt times specifically the amount that the velocity changes. So how much does the velocity change between when it comes in and when it bounces off the car? Now, I've treated this uh, in the problem. They said that it comes in at 20 meters per second, but then it stops. But what would happen if the water were coming in and it were bouncing off the car and coming back off the car at 10 meters per second, right? I hit the car and the water splashes back. Well, that would be an even larger momentum transfer. So it's one thing to absorb all the momentum, but if I'm going to absorb the, all the momentum and push the object back in the direction it came from, that's an even bigger effect. And so the force in this case 
uh, the delta V would be 30 meters per second, and the force would be 45. Yeah, the force equal to 30 just, it just got dropped on that other side. Um, that needs to get added in forces 30 newtons um, in that example. All right, let's look at some examples that maybe are a bit more um, complicated. Uh, what we've got here are just a couple of objects. Here is object 1 with mass 1, and here's object 2 with mass 2. And what they're going to do is they're going to run into each other, and, um, and then they're going to bounce off in different directions. Now, with momentum, uh, it, it turns out using momentum is very handy for collisions like this. If I have objects that are running into each other and bounce away, uh, what we can show is that the momentum going into the collision, so I combine the momentum of object 1 with the momentum of object 2, uh, is equal to the total momentum coming out of the collision. So if I combine the momentum of A and B afterwards, um, that combination will equal the momentum going in. Momentum conservation is a very powerful technique. Um, it's guaranteeing um, if two objects come into a collision with, with certain masses and, and velocities, we can determine what the possible ma uh, velocities will be after the collision. Okay, Here, here's an easier example. Um, um, let's say that we have a 10,000 kilogram railroad car. So here we are with, um, I want to call this object 1 and that object 2, I guess. Uh, this is coming in at 24 meters per second. And uh, the other railroad car is at rest. Now, these numbers seem a little crazy to me. You know, 24 meters per second, that's like, you know, 50, 55, 60 miles an hour. So I've got a train car coming in at, at 55 miles an hour. It runs into another train car. What's going to happen? There's going to be a lot of damage to those train cars. Right? Uh, this is really extreme, but anyway, that's the example they've given us. I hope that the uh, coupling mechanism on the, on the uh, train cars, the railroad cars, uh, have been engineered very well so that there, there's not a problem with this. Anyway, 24 meters per second coming in. This one's at rest. And what it says happens is that they connect, and then they move off together. So that tells us that... Um, First of all, there's no bouncing back on this one. This is what's referred to as an inelastic collision. So uh, now I can write down the momentum before. Now this guy was at rest, and so it's really the momentum from here. M times V naught. Uh, both, I think they said both railroad cars have the same mass. Yeah, it's an identical car. So I dropped the M1s and the M2s um, and just wrote this as M. So the momentum of this one plus the momentum of this one uh, is going to equal the total momentum. Now I can treat those two cars coming out of the collision as having a mass of 2M. And then the, the velocity uh, is V. So both cars had a mass of 10,000 kilograms. Um, the velocity coming in, the initial velocity there was 24 meters per second. Again, this is referred to as a totally inelastic collision, meaning there's no, there's no uh, relative speed of separation. The speed of separation um, is zero. The two objects are moving together at the same speed after. We can always do this. We can always, to tell if it's elastic or inelastic, we can look at the speed before, the relative speed. So the relative speed between those two railroad cars before the collision, the, rel the relative speed was 24 meters per second. After the collision, the relative speed is zero. Oh, and it's down here. So now, a perfectly elastic collision would have a relative speed after that matches the relative speed from before. So if they're coming together at 24 meters per second, they would separate at 24 meters per second. And that's what we mean by perfectly elastic. In those cases, kinetic energy is conserved. Now, uh, anything that comes up short 
is considered inelastic or, or not totally elastic. So there, there's kind of totally elastic, there's totally inelastic, and then there's all this uh, area in between, which is partially, partially, um, I guess it's usually referred to as, as um, still inelastic. All right, so let's put the numbers together. I guess we got to get the, the um, so here uh, are the formulas, the momentum formulas we set up. What this says is, I, I can cancel out the masses, V0 is equal to 2 times V, uh, V then is equal to 1 half V0, and that says 12 meters per second. So that's kind of interesting. What happened was, object 1 had a bunch of momentum, and it transferred half of its momentum to object 2. And now both objects are moving together. So uh, again, it, it's good to think in terms of momentum transfer. So let's add this to the problem. Uh, the change uh, in momentum for object one, now this is final momentum minus initial momentum. So final minus initial tells us what the delta P is. And, and if you notice, I guess I didn't mention, but we use the symbol P for momentum, which also doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense, but that's what we do. Um, so the difference in momentum from after compared with before is the mass of the uh, railroad car and then 12 meters per second minus 24. So what happened is object number one, the railroad car coming in, lost 12,000 units of momentum, minus 12,000 newton seconds of momentum. Well, where did that momentum go? Well, object two, if we calculate its delta P, this is the final momentum minus the initial. Uh, it, railroad car two didn't start out with any momentum at all. After the collision, it had momentum of m times uh, v, and that works out to be 12,000 units. So during the collision, object one, uh, gave up 12,000 units of momentum. Object two picked up 12,000 units of momentum. Momentum was conserved. All right, now you can trace this momentum conservation back to the idea that when contact is made between objects, that the momentum, uh, the forces, are equal and opposite, and they last for the same amount of time. So if the forces are equal and opposite, and they, you know, the force that object one experiences matches the force of object two for the same amount of time, then the momentum transfers will match. Whatever object one gives up, object two is going to acquire that momentum. Um, here's an example with uh, a rifle, shooting a rifle. So the rifle has a bullet inside. Here is after shooting. So in the before picture, the rifle is at rest. It's just there motionless. When you fire this, what happens is there is a force acting on the bullet in the forward direction, but there's an equal force acting oppositely, pushing back on uh, the rifle. So they both experience the same amount of force for the same amount of time. And that says that whatever momentum the bullet acquires in this direction, that's going to be matched by an equal amount of momentum pushing on the rifle in exactly the opposite direction. Now, the masses are very different. The mass of the bullet is very small, the mass of the rifle is really large, and that means the velocities won't be the same. So here's the picture. Here is the rifle. They say that's 5,000 grams. Here is the bullet, that's only 20 grams. And the bullet comes out measured at a speed of 620 meters per second. So if I take M2, V2, um, I can calculate how much momentum the bullet has. Now, if I take M1, V1, that's the momentum of the uh, rifle, and uh, those two momenta have to match. Now, one way to write that would say that the momentum well, the momentum before was zero. That's how much momentum we have to start with. So at the end of the problem, with these two objects going in opposite directions, we still have zero momentum. It's just equal and opposite amounts.
So if I take this formula and saying that the two momentum add up to be zero and solve for V1, V1 is going to be equal to minus V2 M2 over M1. And so the velocity for object one, uh, the rifle, works out to be 2.48 meters per second and it's going in an opposite direction from the bullet. So that's another example of uh, momentum conservation, uh, recoil, when something is fired. All right, back to the, um, back to the tennis ball uh, being hit with the tennis racket. Uh, during a collision, objects are deformed due to the large forces. Uh, so you can see how much the strings on the tennis racket um, are, are bent just a bit, and then you can see the tennis ball is really um, bent uh, from that. Now, the force is equal to dp dt. We can write dp equals f dt. We've done this several times now. Uh, so I, I don't know if this is uh, very clear, the way that this is all being set up. Anyway, take a look through this. Um, these are, uh, I, again, what they're doing is they're trying to show that the force, in general, will vary as a function of time. If we can integrate that function, we can calculate the momentum. Uh, this this uh, amount is called the impulse J, so that's something we also had looked at before. Here's, what, here's kind of what's new and what's more useful, I think. So what we can say is that uh, the momentum transfer is equal to the force, the average force, times the time interval if we look at the integral itself, uh, here is the force as a function of time, and the force grows rapidly and then it drops off. I think they said earlier that the, the tennis ball is only in contact with, uh, it's in contact with the tennis racket strings for, for only four milliseconds, right? And so that delta T here would be, uh, in this case, it's four milliseconds from initial contact until final separation of the tennis ball. So that's only happening for four milliseconds. And the force uh, rises rapidly. Uh, it's when, it's kind of right in the middle, I guess, when the ball is most deformed, when there's the largest elastic force pushing on it. And so what we've done with this formula is we've taken something that's actually fairly complicated and replaced it with an average force. So using momentum uh, calculations, looking at the velocity before and after, and knowing the time uh, during which the ball was in contact with the strings, that's enough for us to get an average force uh, during that time. Now, uh, if you remember from calculus, uh, the area under the curve is equal to an integral, and so that represents the impulse. The impulse is the area under that particular uh, curve. All right. All right. So that's that's kind of uh, for everyone's benefit in terms of thinking about uh, forces acting over you know short periods of time. All right. Let's take a look at uh, some more collisions. So. Any one of these collisions can be thought of as there's a before the collision, they're calling that the approach. And then there's the collision itself, which, which can last for a certain amount of time. And it can be complicated. Uh, the forces acting between the two objects during the collision can be complicated. And typically, we, we don't solve for those. Um, uh, at least we don't solve for them in any amount of detail. So there's the approach, there's the collision itself, and then there is the separation. Uh, if it's perfectly elastic, then the speed of separation, the rate of relative separation, matches the approach rate. If it's less than elastic, if it's inelastic, then the speed of separation will be somewhat less. If it's perfectly inelastic, totally inelastic, then the two objects stick together. There is no relative separation speed at all. So those are the, uh, those are the possible uh, types of collisions. Now, let's take a look at colliding elastically. So elastic collisions mean that, and what we're going to do, we've got this coordinate system set up here. 
Uh, we're going to be working just in one dimension right now. So we're only considering momentum in the x direction. If you go back and look at the examples that we've, we've looked at so far, uh, we've really kept everything moving exclusively in one direction. We'll, we'll look at some two-dimensional collisions uh, a little later. Uh, so here are these two objects, and this one's going faster, and it's going to run into object two. So here's object one, here's object two. And then after the collision, so this is before, and this is after, and remember, we, we don't necessarily, in most cases, we're not going to ask questions about the collision itself. Um, typically we ask questions that involve what happened just as the collision, before the collision happened, and then, and then after. All right, now in this case, if it's elastic, then what we've been saying is momentum and kinetic energy both <coughs> will be conserved. Uh, so we can write two equations. There's a, one equation for momentum and one equation for kinetic energy. So I'm going to do this. I, I hope this works. Uh, if I do the... Um, let's go back and see. So what the textbook is using here is... Uh, V1 and V2, and then they do V1 prime and V2 prime. I have a hard time with primes. Um, and so what I do instead, and what I, I learned from a you know, textbook back when I was taking, taking physics in college, actually, is they used U1 and U2 uh, for the velocities coming in. Now, I know that takes a little getting used to. And then V1 and V2 after. Now, you guys can use whichever approach, whichever nomenclature you want to use, that's fine. Um, so here is before, here is the collision itself, here is after the collision, and what we've got here then is momentum conservation says that M1 U1 plus M2 U2, those are the momenta coming in, are going to equal M1 V1 plus M2 V2 those are the momenta after. So one equation um, for momentum, and, and again, it's a one-dimensional problem, so I'm really thinking of everything lined up such that the uh, momentum, all of the momentum stays, um, all of the momentum is exclusively in the x direction. Now for the kinetic energy, I can take the kinetic energy of object one plus the kinetic energy of object two, and that has to equal the kinetic energies of object one and two after the collision. So kinetic energies before equal kinetic energies after is the idea. So I had two equations. So now I, I, I think I remember learning this my, you know, in college, my freshman year. And uh, I think I still remember it because it was so traumatic. Um, when I looked at these two equations, and they said, take these two equations, it was like a homework problem, and uh, given M1, M2, U2, and U2, uh, U1 and U2, find V1 and V2. And I thought, it's just algebra, it's two equations, two unknowns, how difficult could this be? And then I started substituting stuff in, and I started going in circles. Um, anyway, here is one technique, here's one approach that works pretty well. Uh, what we can do is we can take the first equation, and take the two terms that have M1, bring those over to one side. The two terms with M2, take those over to the other. So I did that for momentum. Now, here with the kinetic energy, we can drop the one half everywhere. And then I can do the same thing. I can bring the M1, V1 squared over to the left side. Anyway, those are the two equations I ended up with. So that upper one is momentum conservation. And the lower one is kinetic energy conservation. Now, again, what I'm trying to find here is what will the speeds be after the collision? They're telling me what the masses are, and they're telling me how fast the uh, two objects are traveling uh, before the collision takes place. But what I want to do is I want to be able to calculate how fast they're traveling after the uh, collision has taken place. All right. So... Uh, so here we go. Uh, what I've got here is uh, those two equations that I wrote down at the bottom of the next page. I put the kinetic energy equations in the numerators, and I put the momentum equations in the denominators. And then what I recognized is this 
is the difference of two squares. So, you know, that's one of our algebraic tricks that we get to use from time to time. Uh, these are differences of squares. So those can be rewritten. Uh, u1 squared minus v1 squared, for example, can be written as u, uh, u1 plus v1 times u1 minus v1. So if you remember how to factor differences of two squares, what we can do then is we can cancel, we can uh, factor these out and then cancel the factor that looks like this. And what that leaves us with is, well, the M1's canceled out, the M2's canceled out, uh, the, factor, um, the, the factorization of the difference of two squares then leaves us with U1 plus V1 is equal to V2 plus U2, and then we can take the U's and put them on the same side and the V's on the other to get an equation that says uh, U1 minus U2 is equal to V2 minus V1. Uh, and what that says is the relative approach velocity, the, the speed at which the relative velocity of approach equals the relative velocity of separation. So that was what we claimed uh, our definition of elasticity meant. And what we did was we started by saying the kinetic energy is conserved and show that if the kinetic energy truly is conserved, then the collisions will be elastic. They'll have the same uh, speed of separation as speed of approach. All right, now, once we get to this point, what we can do is we can start substituting. I took the V2 from here, wrote that as V1 plus U1 minus U2, and substituted that in right here. So, uh, and then a couple more lines of algebra. I brought over the uh, M1, V1, and I brought over uh, all, all of the V1s. So there's an M1, V1 here. There's an M2, V2, uh, V1 here. I put those all on one side. And then I carried everything else over to the other side and combined terms. So I ended up with M1 plus M2 times V1 equals M1 minus M2 times U1 plus 2M2 times U2. Hey, it's, it's, it's algebra, right? And this is it. This must be what I got because it's all boxed and it looks like really important, I guess. Uh, what I got were these two equations. It said that the velocity of object one coming out of the collision is equal to this function of masses times u1 plus 2m2 over kind of the same denominator times u2. So for one-dimensional elastic collisions, this is what v1 looks like. Now, how am I going to get v2? I could go back and do all the algebra over again to get v2, or I could use a symmetry argument. What I could do is I could say, you know, there really isn't any reason why this is object one and this is object two. I could switch their names. I could say this is object one and this is object two. What that tells me is that the equations that I've come up with they have to be symmetric under exchange of indices 1 and 2. So what I can do to write the velocity for 2 is I can copy the stuff from above, but just switch all the numbers. So what I did was this is uh, m2 minus m1 over m1 plus m2 times, uh, v, uh, times u2. And so that is here when I switch those. And then when I uh, switch, the uh, U2 becomes U1, and then the M2 becomes M1. M1 plus M2 remains M1 plus M2. All right. So those are, that's it. If I have a one-dimensional collision acting between two objects, uh, these will tell us how fast we'll be traveling after uh, the collision takes place. Now. There's a, a more specific solution that often is handy in a lot of the homework problems, a lot of the examples that we come up with. One of the objects will be at rest. 
So I could take these equations and set u2 equal to zero. If I set u2 equal to zero, then everything depends just on u1. So that becomes uh, u1. And, and, and then here, here are some interesting considerations for that these, these formulas are predicting. What they're telling us is, if we have, um, if we have an object that runs into an o another object that is initially at rest, what happens to the speeds of those two objects after the collision? And let's look at two extreme cases. What would happen if M1 is much, much bigger than M2? So if M1 is much, much larger than M2, that would say... This object is now at rest, and this object has a lot of mass. This is kind of like, you know, a, a car or a, you know, a large vehicle uh, running into a mosquito. Okay, so the mosquito's buzzing around above the freeway, and a car hits it, and um, you guys know what that feels like when your car runs into a mosquito, right? You go, yeah, it's like I didn't even know the mosquito was there. Now, in... Maybe this isn't the best example. We need something elastic. So we have to imagine that the mosquito bounces off the wind. So it's, it's an elastic mosquito. And uh, what that says is that the speed of the, um, the, speed of the car, or the you know, large vehicle, uh, the speed of that is basically the same as it was before. If, if M2 is really, really small, such that we can ignore it, then the really heavy object, the object with a lot of mass, just keeps going on almost at the same speed that it, it started out with. What happens to the object that bounces off the windshield? Well, that comes out at twice the speed of the, um, of the car. So, so that's kind of interesting, if it's elastic. Remember, this is not where the mosquito splatters on the windshield. This is where somehow the mosquito has a little tiny spring and bounces forward. Uh, that mosquito then would bounce forward at twice the uh, twice the speed of the car. Now, I, you, you can think of it this way too, I guess. If you're hit by an automobile uh, and it's an elastic collision, if the you know if the car is going 10 meters per second, you will be thrown at 20 meters per second. So if the car hits you at 30 miles an hour, you're thrown at 60 miles an hour. That's one way to think about uh, this example with the really high mass object running into something that's really low. Now let's, let's, let's change this around. What happens if we have a really low mass object run into something with a lot of mass? And um, this is kind of called the brick wall approximation. What that tells us, what the formulas tell us is, if it's an elastic collision, and there's a really high mass object and a low mass object hits and bounces back, uh, that velocity, it's, it is going to bounce back, and it's going to bounce back basically with the speed that it came in with. So if a ball comes in at 15 meters per second, it bounces back at 15 meters per second if it hits something that's very high mass, and um, if it hits something that's very high mass um, and, the, and the collision is elastic. Now, what happens with object two is it, it doesn't move, <laughs> right? So if you, if you have something with a lot of mass, something comes in and hits it with very, very little mass and bounces back, um, there's not much, um, much of an effect on the object with the really high mass. The, the speeds are going to be small compared with the speed coming in. So those are, you know, those are a couple of examples we can look at uh, in a little more detail with these elastic collisions. So here we go, uh, example 9.7. Let's say that we have some billiard balls, and the billiard balls are all going to be the same mass, right? So what happens when one of the billiard balls comes in and strikes, um, strikes the other billiard ball? Well, um, we're going to treat these as the same mass. Uh, one of the complications we're going to ignore uh, 
is that billiard balls are rolling. So we actually should be considering uh, not just linear momentum or, uh, or linear velocities, we should be considered uh, rotational motion, and we haven't done that yet. So that's chapters 10 and 11. Uh, so for right now, we're going to ignore rotational effects and treat these billiard balls as if, hey, they're just masses going in one direction. We're going to ignore their rotations. Uh, we're going to assume that the collisions are elastic, and uh, we're going to assume, A, that both, both balls are moving initially, and then in, in uh, part B, that ball B is initially at rest. Uh, so let's see what, these, what this works out to be. Um, so I think we've got to put some, um, some numbers in. Okay, they didn't give us any numbers, so I went ahead and just put some numbers in. Uh, so I went back and just looked at these uh, formulas one more time. Now, what's different this time what's, what's, is that the masses are the same. So if the two masses are the same, then if I look at V1, uh, V1 is going to equal to, well, it doesn't depend on U1 anymore. And so um, that says that V1 then will be equal to, and this is 2M over 2M, uh, V1 is going to equal U2. And V2 is going to equal U1. So what will happen is the two balls will exchange velocities. And I put some numbers in to try and clarify this. So let's say that before the collision, uh, you know, object one and object two, they have the same masses. Object one and object two are traveling along. And uh, before the collision, let's say that, oh, here we go. Uh, before the collision, object one is traveling at five meters per second. Object two is traveling at two. So five and two, the relative speed there would be three. And after the collision, they're going to switch uh, values. So now, object 1 is traveling at 2, and object 2 is traveling at 5. This, so the speed of separation matches the speed of approach. Um, they've reversed, they've, they've transferred, well, that's a good question, I guess, is how much momentum have they transferred? How much momentum transferred from object 1 to object 2 in the collision. We, we would need to know the mass to uh, calculate that, but that's an interesting question to ask. Now, here is the collision itself, and always when the two objects come into contact with each other, they're experiencing the same amount of force in exactly opposite directions. And so that slows down object one and speeds up object two, and we could see if the collision was elastic, what those final velocities would look like. Okay, what happens in the case where one of the objects is at rest? So, uh, if object one comes in and strikes object two at rest, and if they're going to exchange velocities, if object one comes in at five meters per second, this is at zero, these forces speed up object two, they slow down object one, then in this picture, we're going to have object 2 come out at 5 meters per second, and now object 1 will be at rest. Now that's the, you know, that's the specific case where the masses are the same, and uh, one of the objects initially is at rest. One of the billiard balls was initially at rest uh, for that example. Okay, so, um, so we've looked at these uh, elastic collisions. Let me do a quick look at the time here. Uh, I think we might just kind of read through this and then we'll stop and take a break. It's, it's coming up on time to take a break. Uh, what would happen if, instead of the masses being the same, what if the masses are different, and what if one of the objects, the target, uh, is at rest? So, so you don't want to be the target, right, in these examples. Let's see, a very common practical situation is to have a moving object strike a second object the target, which is at rest, uh, assume the objects have, have different masses, that the collision is elastic, uh, 
and occurs exclusively along one direction, one dimension. Uh, derive equations in terms of the uh, initial velocities and the masses and determine the uh, final velocities if the moving object is much. So this is kind of what we did before. Uh, this is coming back and once again it's using uh, we're, we're getting, you know, we're getting a number of examples out of this. These equations that we derived uh, for elastic collisions that are one-dimensional. So let me do this. Let's go ahead and take a break right there, uh, and I'll, I'll start with this um, after the break.